Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Canada School of Public Service. Uh, my name is Nipun Vats, and I'm Assistant Deputy Minister of the Science and Research Sector for Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. Je suis très heureux d'être ici avec vous, et je souhaite la bienvenue à tous ceux qui se sont joints à nous pour l'événement aujourd'hui. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from Ottawa, which means that I'm situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabeg people. Dans le cadre de cet événement virtuel, prenons le temps pour reconnaître que nous travaillons tous dans des endroits différents et que par, séquent, par conséquent, nous travaillons tous dans un territoire traditionnel autochtone différent. Je vous invite à prendre un moment pour y réfléchir. While participating in this virtual event, let us all recognize that we all work in different places and that we are therefore all working in a different traditional Indigenous territory. L'événement aujourd'hui est la, le cinquième volet de notre série Le Canada à la fine pointe de l'innovation, qui est présenté en partenariat avec le ICRA, or CIFAR en anglais, l'Institut canadien de recherche avancée et qui permet aux fonctionnaires d'entendre de grands spécialistes se prononcer sur les questions clés auxquelles la science et l'humanité se confrontaient, sont confrontées aujourd'hui. We have a really a fascinating event planned for you today on the topic of quantum science, uh, a field that takes uh, what we've learned about uh, light and matter on uh, the quantum properties of light and matter over the last hundred years or so, and couples it with uh, technological advances that mean that we're now able to harness uh, what we've learned uh, and realize some amazing applications. And the applications of this technology stretch far beyond those of uh, today's computers, uh, from things like cryptography and code breaking to simulations of materials and chemicals to machine learning. Uh, there are a range of uh, applications that we know of today, and there'll be many more in the future. Joining us today to help educate on the topic of quantum information and on the international race that is currently underway to build the, large, the first large-scale quantum computer is Stephanie Simmons. Stephanie holds many titles. Uh, she is the founder and chief quantum officer of the Vancouver-based quantum company Photonic Incorporated. She's also an associate professor and Canada Research Chair in Physics at Simon Fraser University and a fellow in CIFAR's Quantum Information Science Program. She's, uh, she's also uh, someone who's very passionate about the field and uh, is an outstanding Canadian leader and innovator. So uh, I'd like to welcome Stephanie and thank her for being here today. Uh, before I turn it over to her, though, um, I just wanted to mention a few housekeeping things. Uh, we have a great event planned, and we want to make sure that everyone has the best possible experience. And so to optimize your viewing, we recommend that you disconnect from your VPN or use a personal device if possible. Uh, and if you're experiencing technical issues, it's recommended that you relaunch your webcast link that was sent to you by email. Now, for the next 20 minutes or so, Stephanie's going to walk us through a presentation. Um, and after that, I'll be leading a bit of a conversation and audience Q&A with her. Uh, so audience members are invited to submit questions throughout the event using the Collaborate video interface on which you're viewing this event. To do so, please go to the top right corner of your screen and click the raise hand button and enter your question. And the inbox will be monitored throughout the event. Uh, la major uh, partie de l'événement se déroule en anglais aujourd'hui. Toutefois, il est possible d'accéder aux services d'interprétation simultanée en français en suivant les instructions fournies dans le courriel de rappel. Celui-ci contient un numéro de téléconférence que vous permettra d'écouter l'événement dans la langue de votre choix. Uh, with that housekeeping out of the way, I will now uh, pass the mic over to Stephanie Simmons. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to this. And thank you very much for the invitation and the very, very warm welcome. I do have some slides that uh, will be a bit of a backdrop to, to this conversation. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just open with, it is a space race right now. Uh, you've probably been aware, you see it more and more in the news. And that's because uh, people are starting to wake up to um, the reality that quantum technologies bring, what they're gonna be bringing to the world. But it's only just a glimmer of the future uh, right now. And I'll, over the course of the next couple of minutes, I'll have to try and show you where we're at and where we're going. But it's it's a wild ride right now. Um, and I would say that uh, in terms of the audience here, everybody's first, the public uh, interaction with quantum technologies 
is going to be remote for a little while. Um, some of the early uh, demonstration work will be on, yeah, there'll be specific sensors, there'll be specific elements in computing structures. And the first, uh, I imagine there'll be a lot of work on uh, chemical development, but that will be in the remit of, you know, kind of special teams around the world where it will actually soak into public. Uh, and this is mainly just to get your attention, but when it's going to hit the public awareness, I think is um, my bet is that it'll uh, be the case that the world stops trusting the Internet um, in maybe about 10 years. It'll be like kind of a moment where like, oh, we can't trust the Internet. And that'll be a bit of a shock. Um, and again, it's not guaranteed to happen, but that's my you know, prediction for what it's worth. And I'll, I'll lead into it and like what the, what the surround of that is, but that's to, um, this is coming. Um, and it's very rare that you can actually make solid predictions of the future. But in the, when you think about um, technological advances, uh, you don't necessarily know the shape of them, but there has been a trend over human history that allows us to be confident in at least some of the predictions that we make around technologies. And you can look at this um, across human history and how, how you know, there's been this accelerating pace of change, but it's really been around commercializing various branches of physics. So if you go and take a look at some of the major shifts in terms of power and technology over the you know, human history, you can map a lot of them back to specific branches of physics that went commercial, right? Um, back down to the earliest branches of physics, optics and thermodynamics. And really, when, when you start to see that commercialization process of a branch of physics, right, where it goes from physics to engineering, um, it takes a long time for that to play out. You know, we're talking about Facebook and AI and the rest, but really that is one of the most recent consequences of the transistor, the semiconductor physics going mainstream, right? It's the silicon that we all rely on to have supercomputers in our pockets and have all of this capability, communications as well as, as computing, right? So um, that takes, it takes decades to play out. And the first glimmers of that technology aren't always known. So we're gonna list off a few, but let it just be known that when semiconductor physics, when people started taking a look at a transistor, they, uh, the, the picture there was that it was gonna be useful for hearing aids. Right. They were predicting Facebook and AI. So it'll take a long time. And what we know now won't be the way that it goes forward. But we know that it's going to be transformational. And when you see these things, it usually is the case that people overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term. This is coming. It's coming. There's no way around it. and It's fun. Um, so what is quantum computing? There's a lot of quantum technologies, but I'm going to focus on the juicy stuff because um, in this short conversation. And for me, at least, that's uh, quantum computing, quantum information. The big difference in the laws of physics that allow for this, I mean, because ultimately information is physical and should use all the physical laws that are available. And if you restrict yourself to non-quantum physics, classical physics stuff, you have this picture where um, a bit, a zero is either one or zero. Like it's a bit is one of these two digital outcomes. The digital revolution has given rise to a lot. Quantum mechanics has a different way of holding on to information. When you're not looking at it, it actually can be in superposition of zero and one at the same time. And so here I'm gonna give you a bit of a crutch in terms of, because we don't wanna go through the math, but you can imagine instead of just black or white, it could be any color, any tone, right? And so you can imagine the way that they combine is really where you get the power, but even the element itself is just inherently different. And this leads to one of the uh, discussions we'll get later on. It's just, it's not a blue computer. It's not like a, um, it's not taking a current computer and putting it um, just and fold like we're not it's a very different technology and we're using the word computer because it's the closest thing that we've seen so far but it's completely different technology you're not going to take regular programmers and just move them to quantum it's a very different way of processing and storing information it's the way you get this power from computing is that the information scales differently. And this is the same reason why some chemistry uh, challenges can't be simulated well on a computer, on a today's computer, because it just scales, it just scales exponentially more than a classical computer can handle. So I'm going to give you a bit of a, again, a visual for what this means. But if you were to take a look at all of the information that could be encoded in eight quantum bits, um, you can compare it to what eight classical bits can hold on to, because a bit is just a really bad qubit, really. Um, it's less, right? So one classical bit can't be as big as a qubit in terms of what it can hold. So if you were to think about that, this dot here is representing a given state of those eight bits. 
And so if you imagine an algorithm, what you're doing in a computer is you're actually switching, you're flipping those bits around, you're moving them around. And so an algorithm can be to take, you know, you're changing the zeros to ones and you're moving around on this line, but that's all you get. You get one black dot on that line. If you were to try and compare it to quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics allows for a lot more when you're not looking at it. And one of them, um, one of the early computers that were using classical or using quantum effects is a Canadian company called D-Wave. Now, um, what they were using is part of this rest of this space, let's say. So they were using um, they were using quantum effects. It wasn't universal. So you couldn't do arbitrary things. You can't do arbitrary things on it, but you still can use part of that space to do computation and then arrive at a conclusion ideally faster. Now, what we're and trying to do at Photonic and at SFU is the full shebang. So here you have every color of the rainbow. Like technically you could produce these kinds of states. Just think of the information you can hold onto that compared to eight bits, right? Um, the scaling is really where you get this power. Um, I think it's something like 30 qubits and you can encode the human genome. And if you had 300 qubits, you would have, you would take more bits, classical bits, than there are atoms in the universe to encode it. Exponential scaling is a big deal. And so harnessing these resources for computational gain, it's just a different beast. All right. So um, there's a laundry list of applications that are known, but again, we're not going to be able to predict the future and its consequences completely because a lot of the stuff will be iterative with the future generations that will work with it. But chemistry simulations are the ones that get me up in the morning on this. It's about the ability to actually accurately simulate chemicals, which are quantum mechanical objects, and they just completely go outside the scope of what can be done with a classical processor. And so you really have the opportunity to do battery and material design and unlock a lot of opportunities if we knew how to properly engineer chemistry, chemical interactions at scale. Right now we're using a lot of very successful heuristics, but getting it really scaling with the problem, I think is gonna be a fantastic win. The next one is gonna be, uh, I think the quantum internet is a big one. And this is where, you know, you might be able to breathe a sigh of relief because this allows for unhackable communications, which sounds crazy, but it's relying upon a physical principle, not a computational principle, but a physical principle that um, means you can't copy quantum information. So there's all kinds of beautiful things around authentication and lots of games that can be played by using the laws of physics. It's not relying upon the fact that something's hard to compute. This turns to the next point about um, uh, the internet and why we're using RSA. RSA is the one of the handshake al um, algorithms we use to ensure uh, cryptography, to ensure secure communications between nodes. And this goes all the way up and down in our whole, our whole society. Um, that is weak to quantum attack. They, uh, about a while ago, they are about a, 10 years ago or so, they proposed a different algorithm that should be robust to quantum attack. And then a few years later, there was a quantum algorithm that came out that could hack it. And so this is just inherent to um, an algorithm that relies upon something being difficult to compute. Um, it's hard to prove that something can't be computed. It's, it's a kind of a complexity thing. But anyway, the nice thing about the quantum internet is that there is this physical and hackable thing that we could deploy, as well as there's a lot of work, active work, working on trying to come up with computational um, encryption algorithms to secure uh, everything that we have going forward, because there will come a day when RSA um, falls down because quantum computers can uh, basically read it. So it's, it's going to be a fun transition. It's going to be an interesting one, but we can prepare now. And so that's one of the messages I have uh, to the audience here. Uh, it's also important to recognize what quantum computers cannot do. Uh, so there, um, you may have heard that you can teleport quantum information. That is true. Um, you can't teleport matter. Um, or people, uh, at least not that we're aware of. And when you can teleport information, which is just fantastic, it's like quantum 101, I teach it like the second week of lectures, because um, it's actually really easy to, to see how it works in the math. But um, it can't allow for communication faster than the speed of light. So there's a lot of fun physics on this. Now, what else can't, so it's not gonna help you stream Netflix faster necessarily. Um, what else can't it do? It is not the same thing, as I said earlier, it's not the same thing as a classical computer just on steroids, as it were. Um, it fundamentally attacks different things. Um, for example, one of the things it's quite bad at is division. 
like straight up division that you get with your, you know, pocket calculator or your phone now, right? Um, it's actually really inefficient to do that on a, on, a, on a computer. And so there will be a uh, distribution of computational challenges, some that go towards a quantum solution, but there's no way that classical computing is going anywhere, right? Like that, it's, it's actually essential to even operate the quantum computer is to have really strong backend classical support. So it's kind of a coprocessor in the way that you think about um, accelerators, but it opens up uh, simulation tests that just can't be done any other way. And I would equate it to something like the airplane versus a horse-drawn carriage. Like it is like, there's no way you're, you can iterate on the horse-drawn carriage and come up with a car, but you're not gonna nest, like you have to move to a completely different realm of thinking. Um, if you're trying to solve completely different problems, the airplane is just, it just solves different problems. It's different things that you can't do any other way. Um, now to Canada, right? So Canada has a, uh, you might not know this, but we are a powerhouse in quantum. Um, it was actually lovely to have the prime minister speak to this a few years ago. And it was indicative in the, in the community at the time that, you know, we really are a quantum powerhouse, partly because we had some uh, fantastic support in the early years on quantum and some just geniuses that were happened to be in, that happened to be in Canada. So the early quantum communication, the quantum internet protocols, um, those are uh, partly Canadian invention from Quebec. IQC, I single out as just being an absolute global pillar when it comes to um, quantum computing education and, and moving the field forward. They were one of the early pioneers and one of the really the global epicenter when I got into this game ages ago. Um, it's actually the home of Keysat. One of the um, people working at IQC is uh, the one of the world leading satellite quantum key distribution experts in the world. I would say the only other uh, country that is rivals or surpasses that effort is uh, from China. So just really powerhouse and the quantum startup space. I mentioned D-Wave earlier. Um, they got started so early. One qubit's also really like we've had this kind of ecosystem growing partly to do with the fact that um, we are just a better educated population per capita, right? We, we really do rank quite highly on that. And because we've been educating people for 20 years in this space, you have a lot of people that are now able to take that entrepreneurial next step. And uh, from a macroeconomic perspective, there is investment like crazy in quantum right now. And a lot of the heavy hitters, although not all of them, it's changing, right? But a lot of the startup heavy hitters are Canadian. There's some major players that are from Canada on that space. Um, so this, this uh, chart here is showing you the kind of investment. Uh, that one's actually out of date. The 2021 closing number was 2.2 billion um, for, for investment into the technologies. And you might ask why now, right? So if this is something that has been bubbling under the surface for 20 years, I mean, that's how it goes. It does go through this commercial boom period. Um, and I'll tell you why next. So what really has caught the attention of a lot of people is uh, this notion of supremacy or advantage. I hate both of the terms, but they are used, so I'll use them here. And the idea is that um, when you start getting to this uh, uh, small dozen number of qubit uh, uh, schemes, you are able to compute things that can't be done classically on any reasonable time scale. So the major event that happened in this space was in 2019, um, West Coast Google demonstration, where they did basically a useless task, but it was something that no classical supercomputer could do. Um, that was the assertion made at the time. Essentially, uh, it was challenged, but basically the, the take home point is true. It rivals what you could do with the best supercomputer. And if it's not 53 qubits, it'll be 56 qubits, right? So that was a major milestone uh, a few years ago. They followed up, China followed up a, um, the year after with a, a different demonstration doing the same sort of thing, saying that they were able to demonstrate a computational task, which again, commercially useless, but better than you could do with a supercomputer. And that was kind of like a hello world moment for the space. And everybody suddenly got a lot of, uh, very interested. Now, why haven't you seen anything since? Um, in terms of the space race for quantum computers, there's two major uh, space races going on, I would say. One is the near-term application space, and that's where a lot of the current startups are thinking, but not all of them. And then there's the far uh, more further term error correction space. And so uh, when, I, when we talk about simulating chemistry and cracking RSA and doing all these like logistics 
um, and machine um, uh, Monte Carlo games. Like there's really foundational algorithms that go on every industry. Most of those have been only worked out on pen and paper because we don't have these processors really at scale yet. We're talking about 100 qubits max right now. And all of the algorithms that have been developed have been in this error corrected regime where you need buckets of qubits. Now, I can contest certain um, parts of this figure, but the figure overall, uh, this, this graph overall is indicative of kind of where the space is. And there's a question like, can you make use of these noisy qubits? And so you may hear the term NISC. A lot of people are playing at that. And then there's also other um, uh, firms that are more and more shifting towards this error correction game where you're able to rely upon the qubits. They don't fall over. Um, part of the challenge when you have quantum information is that it has these beautiful superposition states, but if you have a, uh, something measuring it accidentally, which could just be a disruption in the environment, they, they decohere. So I could get into all the nitty gritty, gritty details, but it, mainly I wanted to communicate why we don't see it percolating now, like why you don't have it on the front page of the um, Financial Times yet. It's because there's still work to be done in, in the, using this technology. And until you can get below, below this threshold and at the scale, it's unclear where the commercial value is gonna be, but it doesn't stop people from hunting. These are more powerful processors than can be done any other way. So we're learning a lot as we go. Now, um, to just try and give one slide about what I'm up to and what we're up to, um, no, no real technology stuff here other than to say, um, this is a very well-trodden path when it comes to tech transfer, right? So you get this uh, over and over again, you get this picture where there's about 20 years in academia, and then there's this moment where there's like mass proliferation of startups and commercialization, and there's many options on the table. Following that, there's a dominant design which emerges and there's a mass consolidation event. And then you end up slowly converging towards, um, you know, four or five winning um, firms. So if you were to assume that this follows a similar trajectory, we're in that stage where there are many options and new options all the time. And it's, it's frothy and exciting and everything's changing every week. And it's, it's amazing. Um, and... Uh, what I would say is that uh, our technology, like many other people working on it, we're, we're not work, sorry, there's lots of uh, old technologies that have been developed. Our technology is a newer technology. So you could take a look, this, I didn't make this, I, I'm, I mean, I have differing opinions in what's presented here, um, but there's like a laundry list of different approaches. And this person or this team published this so I can at least cite them rather than come up with just my own opinions on it. Um, and there have been a, many, many more companies than when this was published, because I said there's this explosion of investment and, and startups. What's different about us, if, if anything, I would say is, um, if I were to try and characterize it, we are both of these two blue boxes that I drew. So um, uh, yeah, so we're working on spins in silicon that emit light. And what's, we're the only ones, as far as I'm aware, that are doing this. And it kind of solves one uh, best argument against with the pro of the other one, right? So we're working on spins. They're very, very long lived. I've won awards for it. Um, you can print them. They're in silicon. That's great. Um, they're easier to scale because they talk to each other using the photons that they emit. So photons are particles of light, right? Now, um, that leads you to linear optics. You can have um, photons printed, fiber optics printed into the silicon. So not only is silicon the best semiconductor for electrical processing, which is why we have computers on silicon, it's actually the best material for um, optical uh, uh, processing as well. So the fact that it's lacking key components, single photon sources, it's actually our spins are our photon sources. So that's as technical as it gets, because um, I don't imagine that there'll be much. Uh, I, I'm trying to work the audience here, but happy to take questions. But uh, let me just say that we think very strongly that we're on to something very special. Um, and you'll hear more from us over the over the coming little while. Um, and so just maybe to conclude, I would say that uh, if I'm, if I'm speaking to the government, as it were, um, there's a lot that Canada has to offer here. And we have to have a, um, we have to have a hard look at ourselves and think about how we can improve our systems. Uh, we are the country of the Avro Aero. We are the country of the Candu reactor. And we're actually the country where the patent, where the first patent for the transistor was filed. Um, and I'm not sure if everybody knows that, but it was filed 20 years before Bell Labs got going into it. 
And yet we're not the Silicon Valley for classical computing, right? So there's, there's a lot of, we're, we generate, we are so fantastic at generating TRL, you know, one to three. We are just absolutely fantastic at coming up with new ideas, doing fantastic world-class research, like really unparalleled. And, and if anything, um, just taking that next step, I think is, is, would be really fantastic because we can win at this. We absolutely can. And uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm in it for the, the long ride. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, uh, the team is uh, fabulous. I mean, there's just nothing I can say more strongly about how fantastic Canada has been in supporting the research uh, needed to make this, uh, take this forward. So I'm really happy to take questions. And I really do thank you for your interest um, and for, for showing up. So with that, thank you. Great, thanks, Stephanie, that was great. Um, so I just, before we, before we get into a bit of a chat, I'd, I'd just like to remind people that uh, we wanna hear your questions. So please uh, do submit uh, those uh, by clicking the raise your hand button in the top right corner of your, your screen. And, and we'd be happy to, Stephanie, would be, I'm sure we would be happy to get into some of the details as she said, but I'm sure, she, I mean, I've, I've spoken with her a number of times before about <laughs> quantum technology. And so she she's also quite, uh, visionary and, uh, and, and, and constructively outspoken about what needs to happen in Canada, uh, as well. Um, so, uh, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be happy to go into those as well. Maybe, um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I would just start by, um, just flagging for those who are not aware, uh, on the line that, uh, you know, as, as you said, Stephanie, like there has been a, a long, uh, and patient investment in, in quantum research in the country that has certain, certainly paid off in terms of the talent that's been generated, in terms of the generation of ideas. And in the, and in the last budget, there was also a commitment. Uh, so building on about a billion dollars of investment over, over the last 10 or 11 years, uh, federally in terms of research, there was a commitment in the last budget uh, of another $360 million uh, to develop a national quantum strategy. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's focused, you know, at a very high level, it's focused on talent, uh, commercialization and research, um, um, uh, and to try and bring, uh, Canada's strengths together in a more effective way. So, um, so I guess, you know, you, you kind of hinted at the fact that we're very good at the idea generation stage of things, but not so good at taking those ideas and, and, and seizing the benefits, uh, for Canada, to kind of be, to sort of own the podium uh, with respect to a, a, an area of real uh, disruptive potential for the future, not only in Canada, but internationally. So I'd be curious about, you know, what you think Canada needs to do to really make this happen at this stage in the development of quantum technologies and with the ecosystem that we have. Yeah, no, thank you. And I, I really appreciate um, you asking my opinion on it, I guess. Um, that we don't have to invent anything new. We have to take a look at uh, what other countries do very well. Like there's, there's no part, we don't need to necessarily invent this. We can take a look at really well uh, seasoned systems that exist in other places. And the one thing that I would come back to is something I think we really could do with something like a DARPA program, something where you're, you're able to, uh, the, the government goes in like futures contracts or, or you know, grants in a kind of hands-off way where it's around a certain prize objective. Right. So the way that it's been working, because I've been I've been privy to the funding schemes for quantum across the whole planet. And the way that it works is, is usually uh, different teams can compete to try and meet a milestone. So you don't need to necessarily pick the winners, but the actual milestone um, uh, you, you're measured against whether or not you meet the milestone and then you get some kind of prize. And so if that could be done where it's actually directed to commercial outfits in addition to just research outfits that would go a long way because research is very good at doing one thing perfectly, but really we have to think about how to scale now and scale is a commercial endeavor where you're trying to, anyway, that would be like the one tip. The other thing I would say is uh, from a, just from a, on the research side only from wearing my professor hat, the, there's a very big difference between how we fund postdocs here versus, so I can get very specific if you want, but like um, there, there's a, just an army of postdocs on all of the major efforts, quantum efforts globally. And it's just hard to source resources. Like we have fantastic resources for equipment um, in Canada and, and even just the, just the discovery program is just phenomenal and the CIFAR program and all the rest of it. But postdocs are the kind of, um, they're the most magical scientists out there because they are the most maximally useful. They're the most likely to go and start a company. They are, they know what they're talking about. They could go into academia, but they're just like, 
the the best um, and they would be the most uh, industrious on this front. So I would I would highly recommend yeah amping up the the postdoc uh, game personally. Mm -hmm. Let's see if, uh, if we have some some questions coming in. Um, okay, so here's here's one that that uh, that talks about that relates to your your concerns about encryption uh, mm. and the risk there. Uh, so the the question says uh, the first superpower corporation or individual that will have a quantum computer could theoretically, I guess, a quantum computer fault tolerant, large scale quantum yeah. computer could, could theoretically cripple encryption with dire consequences. Yeah. Do you have thoughts about what the solution is to this risk? Yeah, um, I think uh, part of it is communicating and mobilizing around quantum safe as well as quantum communications. Um, I think quantum safe is you, you can't, we can't imagine deploying quantum cryptography everywhere it needs to be by the time a quantum computer is going to be up and running. And it's going to happen sooner than you think. And it's going to feel very sudden. So we need to seriously invest in post-quantum cryptography. And we need to also, for the critical systems, invest in um, true quantum networks. Like think, we're talking about quantum telcos. We need to be thinking about um, milestones and prizes on distributing quantum uh, entanglement across Canada as quickly as we can, <laughs> because there will be critical resources where, yeah, like you can't trust RSA. And um, there will be a time where even if you can imagine a post-quantum uh, reality where there's like an, a, a cryptographic technique that stands at least up to some scrutiny, it won't have stood up to 50 years of scrutiny through classical attack or quantum attack, but it throws up to something. We need to make sure that we at least plug all the gaps. We, we've had a recent experience with global affairs and the hack, and I mean, like, but information security more broadly is, is going to be a, an extra challenging task where you don't even know where all the edges are, right? Um, in addition to, like, we already think we do and we're already getting attacked, right? So it, it, we do need to invest in that very defensively. Um, and also, yeah, it would be great if Canada was the home of that winning horse, because then we could collectively be in control of it, right? And make it known to the world that, you know, we have this technology, we're not going to use it to break RSA, but, you know, you have your warning, get mobilized, right? Get in, get in front of it. Right. And, and just, just so, I mean, for, for the audience, um, so, so the, uh, you mentioned quantum safe and you mentioned, mm. uh, you know, quantum, uh, truly sort of quantum networks. So, yeah. so this is the idea of um, of using classical algorithms for for encryption that would be uh, immune to uh, to uh, to attack uh, by uh, by a quantum computer, if you will, right? And, and yeah, and you, the problem. You, sorry, go the ahead. Pro sorry to interrupt. Um, the problem <laughs> is, is that they they um, it was the standards were set a, a while ago where it was believed that such an algorithm had been identified. And then only a few years later, it fell. So I would say we can't, like, I don't know how the trust is going to look. This is like a public trust thing. This isn't yeah. even a technical thing. Um, because those, whatever the new post-quantum algorithms are, they won't have been battle tested for 50 years. So there will be questions, even if they do look to be good against quantum, it's going to be unclear if they actually hold up to scrutiny. So yeah, I think we need a layered approach um, because we rely on information distribution too much now. You know, it's, it's kind of a bit, so it's, sorry, I didn't want this to be the case, but <laughs> I'm just in it for the other stuff, but yeah. uh, it is true. And we should um, take the opportunity to think about secure networks from the ground up, right? Like, anyway, yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, that just speaks to people in government who are thinking about data security and about yeah. uh, privacy and protection of information. And and we, uh, we don't necessarily think about it in those terms, but, it, you know, what you're pointing to is the fact that there will come a time when all of the sort of short-term protections that we are thinking about putting in place may no longer be the way to think yeah. about the problem. And we should get ahead of that is, is essentially yeah. what I'm yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And the other thing, like I'm not a post-quantum person, but I do yeah. see the value. Like I don't want our field to come across as the bad guys in this space, right. right? I'd rather be defended. And I would say that there's also something else is that there's information in the wild that's already being collected now in the view that in 10 years time, it's going to be decrypted, right? right. So there's, you know, there, there's really no reason not to layer on lots of layers of, of protection, as it were, from an information security perspective, including hopefully the truly unhackable one, right? We have a provably unhackable one, which will be a limited resource, but we have it. And we have some of the world's best experts in this exact area because we were half invented it ourselves, right? Like not me, but so there, we have a really um, strong legacy there that we can leverage. And I think there should be really targeted um, yeah, um, prize, prize investments in that direction. That would be my, my take. 
so here's another question that's that's actually a, a, a very good one uh, that uh, we often struggle with in, in, in jobs like mine, where you're trying to explain to the public uh, or, to, or to ministers or people who aren't necessarily so initiated uh, what the relevance of these technologies is. Uh, and so the question is very simple. It's, it's um, how would quantum computing impact or change the life of the average Canadian? Because as you said, it's not as though everyone's going to have a, you know, a quantum a CPU on their desk uh, and it's going to sort of do different kinds of things. So how would you actually just say to a, uh, to a, an average Canadian, uh, assuming there is such a thing, um, uh, you know, what, how this is going to actually impact uh, their daily life at some point? Yeah, so I, I tried to allude to the the you know the data information one. I don't want this to be a too negative. Um, there's there's a lot of ways in which uh, algorithms have helped everything we do, right? Like just the ability to even have a real time conversation like this is to do with a lot of algorithmic development. And so yeah, there will be um, information will be held in a very secure way. We'll have authentication. Like you can't. Anyway, there's, there's lots of stuff there. Sensors will come in, um, but it'll basically be through the improvement of, I think, frankly, material development and drug development will be the first one. Um, that's where we're gonna start to see, um, be able to do, say, toxicology studies in silico. Like how phenomenal would that be, right? Where you can actually really de-risk the three phase trial um, aspect way in advance by having a true simulation of what's going on. Think about battery development properly, right? Like we're using a lot of heuristics and iterative tests because we can't simulate at that scale. Um, so drugs are another one, batteries are another one. Um, there's, uh, in terms of logistics, I mean, logistics affects everything that we do. It's why we can have, you know, a delivery arrive on our doorstep and again, like it matters the way life, um, so there's these kinds of iterative things that'll feed into, um, you'll see it really, it'll affect, basically there'll be a giant hype cycle in the same way that how does AI affect um, everybody's today? Like it does, it changes th the way things are recommended to you and how you interact with um, various service providers, but you're not yourself typically um, waking up in the morning and, and training a neural net. I mean, some of us are, but not everybody. So it'll become about through the second order effects because they're very foundational technologies and they won't, eventually they'll be boring. Eventually it will be something that you don't talk about, right? It'll just be something that um, makes everything more helpful. Right. That's a, that's a vision. So there, there's a question here on talent, which is also an interesting one. I mean, the, the question itself says, what do you think we could do to make sure our best PhD students don't seek opportunities south of the border? But I think it's it's a more general point where you know if you if you visit any of the centers of quantum technology around the world, I, at least in my case, the, the first thing they'll say is we love Canada because they train the best people, <laughs> and then and then we try and scoop them up, um, and and so I mean it's not unique to quantum, but but it is a particular case in quantum where the the global pool of talent is so limited. Uh, so do you have any thoughts on on how we could retain uh, more of that quantum expertise here at home? Yeah, postdocs. Sorry. I mean, like there's there's some specific tweaks I would make to the um, my tax program, which is where a lot of um, postdoc support comes from. I would say have an entrepreneurial stream for for my tax as a specific recommendation, but really just rebalance the way that funding works for postdocs, because there are no postdoctoral proportionally to the number of absolutely like world class trained PhD students. There just aren't postdoc spots in Canada for them. Um, so there's nothing wrong with going overseas. I would say the, the, the thing that Canada can do most is just keeping a fantastic place to live. And if we can make the companies successful, people will want to work for those companies here, right? Like that's why I came back to Canada. That's why I started the company in Vancouver. We can recruit to Vancouver. Um, it's a, it, it's, you know, it's Canada's big shot at a, a good um, standard of living and yeah, it has phenomenal talent locally. So I just keep being awesome at that and then try to make those companies successful through those mid TRL level um, uh, prize or grant um, uh, investments and yeah, the postdoc thing, just to round it all back. Right. Uh, here's, here's another one, which talks about um, the international context. So, so the question it says, Steph, thank you for a wonderful presentation. You speak quite a bit to winning the space race and Canada taking a lead in the quantum industry. However, how important would you say international collaboration is to propelling the field forward? Are there are opportunities for collaboration growing globally? Or would you say the opportunity for global teamwork is narrowing as countries become more tentative to share information so they might win the space race? 
Yeah, it's a really interesting dynamic. It's a very interesting dynamic. So um, there's uh, definitely um, still this mass proliferation of startups and where you have everybody building off each other. And that's where it's in the really research side. As soon as it goes through the acquisition phase, there's going to be a giant tightening, I imagine. There's going to be like export controls. It's going to be a bit messy. So I would love for it to be as open as it could be. Um, but things are already shifting. They're already shifting to being more... Um, People are more nervous about IP. People are more nervous about uh, our own security, right? And being scooped. And it's starting to go from being that really open, supportive, like blue sky stuff to being more commercial, more directed and more competitive. And that's to be expected. Um, in terms of international, if you were like, I'm of the opinion that we have the winning horse and that we're going to win the whole thing. So, I mean, that's not surprising for me. I'll just say that. I think we are. However, if you don't believe me and you don't think that's the case, then yeah, there, there's um, a lot of room for iterative development because all of the different platforms out there um, really could benefit from a lot of iterative development. There, there, I don't think there's, um, be, we're working on this technology because there exists skeletons and all those other closets that do, would benefit from having lots of uh, collaborative uh, development and yeah, I'm sorry, that was a bit of a nebulous answer, but there's, um, you could go either way on that one. I mean, one thing that, um, uh, you know, is discussed a fair bit uh, across countries that are, across governments of countries that are that are involved heavily in quantum technologies is, um, is collaborating um, so that uh, there's some compatibility in our technology so that, they're, that you're dealing with trusted partners internationally so that you have access to, 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 to markets. Right. So, mm. so there is, I think there, there's, it's still kind of early days, but, but, but people yeah. do talk about the role of governments and kind of making sure that, you know, as these, as security concerns become greater, you mentioned export controls and other things that we are, yeah. we're doing so in a, in a conscious way so that we're not denying kind of market access to our great companies uh, internationally. So that's, that's certainly it'll be a that, balance it'll be yeah. a balance with any kind of um with any kind of technology this powerful it's going to absolutely be a balance just to be strict and and yeah standards are another one um to your point right yeah. like setting up the right standards so that we're not boxing ourselves in by not being at that table yeah it's it's a big geopolitical game to be played i i uh um it's a big game yeah let me see here um there's a question here So this is uh, this is kind of a it's a hard hard question to get your head around, but I think someone is is trying to understand the distinction between qubits and uh, and sort of a um, a, a classical bit. Um, and mm -hmm. and and so they I'll read the question first, but it might require a little bit of interpretation. It says, with zeros and ones, we string them together to mean different things in the real world. These mappings form a standard. Uh, you know, for example, they're uh, like things like ASCII characters. <laughs> mm. um, and so they're asking, is there a similar kind of standard being developed in quantum computing to represent things in the in the world as well? And, and if so, what would those standards look like? So I guess it's kind of like a, how much of this is about modeling kind of the physical reality of things and how much of it is represent representative, right? And yeah. kind, of, kind of collect, you know, sort of manage information. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's a fantastic question. And it actually extends into, um, if, as, if I'm interpreting it correctly, it extends into a whole bunch of stuff around the quantum stack more broadly. Um, so I would say when we're when we're talking about the, the goal of demonstrating millions of qubits doing large algorithms, those algorithms are known, but they're completely up for um, uh, reinvention all the time, like people working on them, improving them, remapping, re like there's a lot of work to be done on the algorithms to make the total resources needed to execute them fewer and fewer. Um, this is really back to the, the transistor days where you have to kind of co-optimize every bit of the resource because you don't have extra resources yet. You're really about squeezing all the power you can out of everything you can. And therefore those mappings are, are algorithm dependent. Everything's a bit of a wild west situation. There isn't, there's some standards that are starting to emerge on some of the languages, but again, everything's kind of up for grabs. It, it really is this kind of wild free for all where people are trying to, um, first demonstrate value and then standards come later. And, and that's why that's what's gonna happen. Once a dominant design emerges, 
it will form the basis for a lot of standards to come forward, but there, it's still really up in the air what that looks like um, in the broader community that's, that's yet to be emerged. So yeah, people are trying to set those standards, um, but again, I think it's gonna be open to flux given that there's so many uh, wild changes that we expect over the next couple of years. Right, and, and this, this idea of the, uh, just to, to add on to what you just said, this idea of the, the stack, it's basically you have the machine, but then you have the, 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 the way that that machine communicates with the end user and all of the kind of software that sits between the, the device and the end user. And we kind of take that for granted with classical computers because it's been done yeah. over so much time. But, but it, it's maybe just to point out that Canada actually has a lot of strength in, in various aspects of that stack as well. And so, um, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, there are a lot of inter- multinational companies that are trying to kind of own the stack, if you will. <laughs> um, and, uh, and part of the benefit of having, you know, so many great quantum computing companies in Canada is that it, it creates a diversity uh, yeah. of, of technology, but also allows for Canadian companies that are working on those other layers to actually be kind of innovating and, and, uh, and, uh, and avoid locking into something prematurely. So I think that's, that's kind of an interesting strength of, of, of Canada as well, because it's not just, I mean, it's, it's about hardware, but it's all the other pieces that make this go. That, that's, that's pretty cool. Sorry, too. I lost you. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, so there's a question here. Um, this is a classic question uh, for, uh, for um, advanced technologies in Canada. Uh, uh, what do you think Canada needs to do to grow its quantum industry to higher TR levels rather than being purchased by larger companies such as Google and IBM after reaching a certain size? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, uh, we're trying. Um, so the, I, I really do think that um, kind of tech translation stage is something that we can look to other world-class small scale um, countries and see what they've done and try and adopt some of those techniques. Um, I come back to, I think the DARPA program is a really big one, but it also speaks to uh, a kind of good goodwill that exists within Canada. So Um, For example, Canada has invested in me. I came back to Canada specifically to try and make it work here. Um, There, and and really, it's also a good hiring strategy. That's where the talent is. This is a talent play. This will be a talent play. And to your point earlier about global reach, these will be global companies. This will form, these companies will form part of that backbone. It's about just being brave enough to say no to, you know, low level acquisition numbers and, and having a vision of the future and actually driving it to conclusion. But part of that is, yeah, making it happen because at some point, um, if, you can make it work here then you do but if you're if you're offered something that you can't say no to then it's it's a challenge so it's about making sure that there is enough support here to make it work for the uh, for the companies here and that's why i come back to these kinds of prize programs um these kinds of futures contracts procurement solutions it's it's before pre-revenue all of this is pre-revenue we're talking about owning a completely new future direction but yeah, investing in the backbones that we know that we're going to need. We're going to need a quantum telco, right? We're going to need it. And so let's just invest in it. Right. Um, so here's, here's a, a, a question that might be hard to answer. Um, and uh, so, so, so the, someone here said, and I, I'm actually very uh, happy to see a question like this. Wow, I have a steep learning curve ahead of me to learn more about quantum as a policy advisor. Uh, what resources can you recommend? What's the best way for someone from your perspective to learn about quantum technologies as somebody who's, you know, not an expert, um, um, but, but wants to know about it because they want to make sure that they're being, they're well-informed as a citizen, but also in terms of uh, contributing to public policy development? Yeah. um, What I would say is that there has been an absolutely enormous investment in education. And again, not just in Canada, although Canada has been absolutely leading the way on a lot of this work. Um, There's there's also a lot of resources that are out there um, that, yeah, are talking to the policy side of things through the US right now. I would say they they went through a major change where they realized about five years ago, oh my goodness, we need to catch up to Canada. Maybe, Maybe 10 years, but like it was a major shift where like the epicenter of the world was Canada in terms of education and the rest. And now there's been a lot of work on the economic, um, Development Consortium for Quantum in the States. There's also a lot of fantastic work happening um, in Europe on on a policy front here. Um, 
yeah, there, there's there's a lot of content out there. It's a complete different map than it was about five years ago. So I can't name specific resources, although you're happy to reach out to me and I can dig those up. But there's just so many now that, um, yeah, it's yeah, a good and, place and to be. I think there are actually some some communities of practice and government that are starting to wrap their heads around this as well, like in terms of how it how we need to be thinking about it. So, uh, you know, maybe I could offer uh, to connect people to those those communities as well if they if they wanted to reach out to the organizers and and um uh and, and uh and learn more about these things um i mean i, I didn't mention this uh, stephanie knows this but i but uh, many years ago i was a quantum researcher <laughs> i know so, i love your i uh, read your thesis <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just fascinating to see how things have evolved um uh, and uh and um it's actually really cool for someone like me to be in a job like this now after spending uh most of my career in in non-science related jobs so so i i, I only say that because you know I, i'd i'd be happy to help people learn more <laughs> uh short of giving them lectures on uh, on uh 20 year old outdated uh, uh, <laughs> uh concepts but uh, um let's see here um <laughs> here's a, here's an interesting question. Do you see the next 10 to 20 years as analogous to Apple versus PC versus Android, i.e. a number of dominant technologies or a future more like VHS versus beta where one dominant technology for quantum computing will emerge? Mm. Um, yeah, it's a timing question. I think there will be, uh, there's a lot of momentum on hardware. The switching cost between quantum hardware is incredibly high. So I think some of the better invested um, older technologies will take a long time to kind of say, okay, fine, we're going to give it up. Um, I don't think it'll be a Betamax VHS. I think it'll be, you might end up having, um, a, you know, specific use cases breakthrough into the commercial realm tailored around one technology. Like it could be that maybe Ion Chaps really cracks a financial algorithm and then they just become the workhorse for finance for their thing, right? Or, or maybe there's a Monte Carlo solution through, I don't know. So the, there's, you can imagine maybe that kind of circumstance, but it's not going to be static. So whatever I answer will just reflect a snapshot in time. I think the, the, the broader pattern of having a dominant design um, that emerges, I think that will come. I don't know how long it'll take to get there, but I think it will come um, because yeah, standards do form over time. Things do prove to be more useful than others. And um, at some point one technology does win out, but it's not, um, I, my, my read of this right now is that, um, once somebody cracks it, like properly cracks it, it's going to be such a game changer compared to the competition that it won't have like a, um, uh, there won't be like two closely tied uh, uh, companies. I think it'll just be one thing that dominates and wins. But that's, again, this me projecting and kind of my guess at it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. It's a weak, it's a weak projection. I wouldn't be surprised if it breaks the other way for a short time. Right. Um... Let's see here. There's there's a question here, um, which which asks what are potential government applications of quantum, and, and and it says and this is maybe something where we should also just mention that you are focusing on quantum computing. Yeah. When when we talk about quantum technologies, it's a much bigger basket yeah. of things. Um, uh, and, and so so, you know, I think we've talked about some of the potential applications of quantum computing. Um, but I don't know if you have any more sort of broader comments on quantum technologies and government or, or quantum computing and government applications. Um, so I would say anything that requires anything that's a computational challenge right now from a, from a scaling perspective, you should at least ask the question as to whether or not there exists a quantum algorithm that could help it out. And so, you know, you get a lot of logistics stuff, Monte Carlo, people do, Monte Carlo is kind of everywhere in terms of how things are simulated. There's the speed up there, matrix manipulation. Um, I mean, it's very broad. These are very foundational things, um, but it will be a coprocessor sense where instead of it running on a classical on a supercomputer on AWS, you'd send the job to some quantum data center somewhere. Yeah. More broad, you asked about more broad applications. Yeah, so there's a lot of things that um, you just can't do. Like if you use quantum physics, you can do stuff that you can't use classical physics. So sensing is one of them. You, there's some things that are just inherently more sensitive and you can extract things that way. There's um, I, There's been some push towards imaging, quantum imaging, you can do things there. So there's a lot of defense applications on that kind of thing, um, which yeah, no, we didn't get into. And um, yeah, those are the broad categories. But again, I feel like this is very much like transistor 101 level where we have, we've picked out like a few things 
remember we have not built one of these things yet right so there's a lot that we're going to learn when you have a generation that is brought up playing with them that's really where you're going to get it people that break it and put it back together and figure it all out and it'll take a generation to really see all that because again when you when they projected hearing aids with the first transistor they were not thinking about facebook so it's <laughs> you know they're not yeah um just looking at the other questions here um there's there's a question here about um how i guess it's a question of how you get your your hands dirty a little bit in terms of learning about quantum algorithms and things they're asking if there are any open source initiatives in the area of quantum computing that that people can get involved in i mean i know there are some things like for their smaller scale systems even ibm will give you access yes. uh, to, yeah. to play with the, with their with their quantum computer and i know there's there's the, in, in vancouver there's a quantum algorithms institute and i don't know if yeah. they're actually providing some open access as well but maybe you could speak to some of these things too yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of, so I was mentioning that there's like an error correction mode and then a near term mode. Um, a lot of companies are trying to work on that near term mode, you can get access to um, a lot of hardware that way. So yeah, IBM is one of them. But there's basically you can go to Microsoft or Amazon Web Services, they both have basically front ends for various hardware providers. Um, these are all small scale systems, but they're still if you want to start playing with small scale systems, I would say really what it is, it's about I think this is going to, if you, if you take a look at classic computing and you try and model it that way, there's going to be a massive shortage of people that know how to program these things, like just ridiculous shortage of, of people. And it'll end up being um, in the way that IBM was in the early days, they have kind of dominance over the people that know how to program these things. And then they offer the services on top of that as like a consulting basis, or they work with the external providers to kind of deliver on a, a particular algorithm. And it'll be that way for a while until there's a mass prolifer more more talent development on the algorithm level. But again, until we have standards, <laughs> so it's going to be one of these. Uh, right now, it's a co-design challenge. So right now, yeah, there's lots of people you can get engaged. Um, there's lots of open source work on near term stuff for sure. But I would say that everything is subject to revision because it's so early in terms of standards and expectations. But the concepts of like what is a qubit what is superposition what are these things what are the kind of algorithms that exist those things are known and so yeah throw yourself into it there's lots there's lots out there yeah so if people want to get involved they certainly can there's lots of there's lots of fun stuff to learn there for sure so I, i'm mindful of time we, we've got a, just a, a few minutes left and so uh you know i'd just like to say thank you uh stephanie for uh an excellent presentation and some great questions from the audience as well so uh you know i hope that people found that interesting and useful and We'll, uh, we'll seek out more uh, information and think about how to integrate some of this into their, into their day jobs as well. Um, so uh, uh, we want to thank our series partner as well, CIFAR, for helping uh, the school bring uh, these unique and educational events to our audience. Et enfin, merci à nos apprenants de la fonction publique qui se sont inscrits et ont participé à l'événement aujourd'hui. J'espère que vous l'avez trouvé aussi intéressant que, que moi. Uh, it's, been, it's been great to have this conversation today. So your, your feedback is, uh, is very important to us uh, and to the school. And so I'd invite you to complete the electronic evaluation that you're going to receive and the thank you email from the Canada School in the coming days. And if you've enjoyed today's event, um, I guess up on screen are some upcoming events um, uh, which, uh, which uh, could be of interest. Uh, there's one on, I see there's one on AI. There's, uh, I think the next one in this series is uh, a new approach to harnessing the, oh, sorry, the, I'm not sure if this is an, an uh, this is an NRC, sorry, uh, presentation on a new approach to harnessing the potential of quantum computing. So there you go, you can, you can, uh, you can uh, this whet your appetite and you've got another one that you could, you could go to. Um, uh, and then uh, there, are, there are some other events that are, that are being shown there. So registration details can be found in the, as well in the thank you email, or you can check out the, uh, the Canada School website. So thanks again, uh, Stephanie, and thank you all for, for being there and um, uh, enjoy the rest of your day and your week and, uh, and stay safe. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.